Okay, uh, and hello, welcome to the next installment of Student Dave. Hello. Hi. Okay, his eyes are kind of close together. Okay, so we're going to go and continue our saga with the Calm On filter. And before we're talking about the theory behind it and some of the, some of the general ideas of how it works, and now we're going to get into a lot more of the specifics and then do an example uh, in MATLAB, okay? So, uh, we're going to continue our story with the Beijing Ninja, if you recall. Here's our ninja friend. There's his eyes. There's his mouth. But in fact, he masks those eyes with the mask. <laughs> and um, basically, he's got some issues with quail, you know. Maybe, maybe he loves quail. We don't know. But anyways, all we know is that last time we saw him, he was up in a tree. So here's a tree. And there's the tree. And he was up inside that tree, so there's his bandana, and he's like, what? Right? Because there's bushes below, and he thinks there's a quail in there. So he hears squawks and all kinds of stuff from this quail, and eventually he gets some estimate about where he thinks the quail's at. It turns out to be a pretty accurate estimate. And the quail's right there, and then he bails. He jumps down, and he's going for that quail. There's his little body, there's his little head, and he's flying down. But he learns really quickly that this quail is really freaking fast. And as, mil as soon as he starts to fall out, the quail hears him, and the quail books it. The quail's out of there. So let's just draw our quail friend. And the quail books it. And, and uh, well, I guess this is a, 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 like an airplane quail. It's a super fast quail with, like, jet packs. And so the quail's gone, taking off, right? And so the ninja immediately uh, jumps to his feet and takes off and starts flying, right? So there he is. And, you know, the quail's over here now. And he's flying. But it turns out that he, as he, when he landed in the bushes, his little mask got turned backwards. And now he can't see. He's kind of freaking out. He can see a little bit, but he can't see that well. And then there's clouds in the way and stuff. And so he wants to really chase down this quail, but he's got all this noise about where he thinks the quail's at. Like he's looking forward. He kind of sees the quail, but he doesn't know if he's estimating correctly. And so what he's going to do is he's going to use the common filter to uh, track this quail. So uh, let, let's just give, let me just give a little bit more detail on it. The idea is that say this is position and this is time. Here's the actual trajectory of the quail. He's like, Phew, he's gone. He's accelerating. He's taking off, right? And uh, there's the ninja, and the ninja is going to see a bunch of points like this, kind of around it. Like these are where he sees the quail through time. And rather than following some nutty trajectory, he'll never catch the quail that way. He wants to follow a nice straight line. So the quail is changing its position. We could model that, or the ninja will model that with a, you know, natural physics, you know, motion, physics of motion and velocity and stuff. And then he'll use his measurement about where he sees the quail at and use those in combination to try to follow a very best estimate of where he thinks the quail's at so he can chase it down. So that's what we're going to do in this installment. Okay, so let's try to formalize this a little bit more. So again, we'll start off with our plot. We have our position, and then we have our time, and we have our quail taking off, accelerating, that's the reason it's curved, and then we have our measurement data from the ninja as he's flying, as he's trying to see where the quail's at, and there's error, and so rather than flying some nutty trajectory or whatever, the, well, it's not so oscillation, but anyways, rather than flying some nutty trajectory, we like to try to estimate that'll follow that trajectory. Um, by using that data and also using a prediction of where we think the quail is at. Okay, so we first need to model our state prediction model, our state transition model, right? And again, we said that was x of t equals um, alpha or a times x of t minus one plus b times the uh, plus the times the control data at time t plus the error term, right? And so. First things first, what are we going to model the state? What is the state? Well, we already said position is important, but I think to make this a more uh, complete story, we'll model it as position and velocity. So this would be two component state, position and velocity for the overall state of the quail. All right. And so how are we going to model this? Well, this is a trajectory through, uh, through uh, on Earth. It's following some algorithm, and we can basically say this is following one of your basic laws of uh, physics. Um, basically a, a moving object with velocity and acceleration. So that uh, standard equation is going to look like this. You'll have position at time t equals position at t minus 1 plus the velocity at time t, or uh, a velocity at t minus 1 times the time plus um, 1 half 
times the acceleration times t squared. This is a, a description of position by physics. And then a velocity at time t is going to equal velocity at t minus 1 plus acceleration at t times, um, um, times, times the time, right? So this is your classic uh, physics equations. So we're going to render this into our model through the a's and b's. So let's go ahead and do that. So our x of t is going to equal our position at time t and our velocity at time t. And that is going to equal this matrices. 1 times the time, 0, 1, times the position at t minus 1, times the velocity at t minus 1, plus, uh, and now this is going to be our input, our input acceleration. And so this is going to be like this. Um, and it's going to be t squared over 2, and this is t, and this is going to be our acceleration at time t, and plus our error term. Error term. Okay? So, if you get, if basically this goes back to basic uh, matrices, matrices math, but basic, let me show you how this looks. So we're going to have P of T, V of T is going to equal, we multiply this like this, and so this will be P of T minus 1 plus V of T minus 1 times the time plus T squared over 2, maybe we should write this T like this, like that, times the acceleration at time T, that's the top, and the bottom, this goes to 0, it's plus uh, V of T minus 1 plus T times A of T plus the error term. And you can see this gives us back our equations. These two equations here are these two equations here. Our systems are linear systems of equations to describe the position and the velocity through time. That's our state prediction. Now we're going to have our measurement prediction. Measurement prediction. State prediction, measure prediction. And remember that was Z of T is going to be equal some matrices times the predicted state plus some error term of the measurement, right? And so considering we're only measuring position, it's going to be Z of T is going to equal P is going to be equal to 1, 0 times P V. This is P V T, P T 1, P T minus 1 plus our error term Z. So the velocity is just going to go away and we end up with just our positional information, that which we are measuring. So we're not measuring velocity, we're just measuring position. So we're going to do a measurement prediction. And then we have our state prediction. And now I'm going to show you how we calculate the variances in those distributions and then uh, show the Kalman uh, equation for running this through and doing the estimation. Okay, now before I show you the uh, full algorithm and the nastiness of the Kalman filter, um, let me just break down all the terms we're going to be putting into it, and it'll make everything a lot more clear. So, what we have first is our state uh, prediction, our state estimation, and that's going to be equal to 1 t, t the, the time interval, then there's going to be x of t minus 1, this is our term A, plus our term B, which is going to be the time interval squared over 2, and then the t there as well, times the acceleration, plus our error term. Then our measurement estimate is going to be equal to c, which is 1, 0, times our state estimate, plus our error in the z term. Now, the Kalman filter requires that these things are written in covariance matrices. Um, that's just part of the way the algorithm performs, and so let's just do that. The error in the state, because we have two terms, it's going to look like this. This is the way the covariance matrices will look. It's the squared standard deviation, or the variance in the position. Then it's the covariance, the, the standard deviation of the position times the standard deviation of the variance, I mean, of the, of the uh, velocity. Uh, the same thing here, but just the terms reversed. And then the uh, variance in the velocity. And so that's going to be your covariance matrices for the um, state prediction, and then for the measurement, we'll call that uh, another capital E, but for Z, this is an X. And that will equal, well, we just have one term, so that just be the variance in our measurement, squared. Well, the standard deviation squared is our variance. And so this one we could just define. We could just say it's something. We could say, like, oh, it's 10 feet. You know, that's our standard deviation. Whereas this one, 
Um, we could also just define it. In this case, it's going to be the acceleration, the standard deviation in the acceleration, which is our input. But to, to see what the standard deviation is in the position, well, we've got to multiply that out because this is the effect. T squared over 2 is the effect it'll have on the position. And so it'll be that standard deviation times that value here that'll give us the uh, standard deviation in the position. And then uh, uh, similarly, we'll multiply the standard deviation in acceleration times the time and get that for the velocity get the standard deviation for the velocity, and then we can plug and chug and fill in this covariance matrices. And so we have our terms A, B, C, and then the covariances of the state and the measurement. Okay, so what we can do then is take all these terms, all these variables, and plug them into the common filter algorithm. And there are a number of ways to represent this algorithm. Here's our representation. Now don't freak out. Uh, there are a lot of equations, a lot of things going on here, but we're not interested in any derivations, and so we don't want to know why you're multiplying this times this. We're interested in understanding what are the different variables doing and what are the dynamics in this. Okay? So the first thing to point out is that, remember, we're looking at Gaussian distributions, right? And so the descriptions of Gaussian distri distributions, or the parameters of it, are going to be the mean value and the variance in it. And so what we're calculating when we're doing the state estimation is what is that expected mean value, and then we need to get the covariance in order to uh, describe the distribution. The reason it's covariance rather than just pure variance is because we have multiple states. That is, we have our um, position, for example, and velocity, and so you represent it in this way. And so the point is, what we have here is we have our, as we talked before, we have our state uh, prediction based upon our prior state and the control input. But then we now would take a look at the error here, and we basically take our prior covariance and add on to that the, um, the expected variance in the state, and we get our new predicted variance, uh, covariance. Now we have the common, fill, the common gain. And the important thing from this is basically to think of it as like an information measure, and here's why. What we have is here is we have some matrices multiplied by some other matrices that had on it, added onto it the error in the measurement, and it's going to be an inverse of this. So the idea is that the larger this is, that is the larger the variance in the measurement, the smaller this value will be. So the more variance in this, the less informative that, that measurement will be, and therefore the smaller this will be. So think of common gain as a measure of information. So to get our final state prediction, as we talked about before, is you're going to have your state prediction plus um, the correction times the weighting factor. So first of all, the bigger the difference between this, the larger we should care about it because we're basically it's a bigger and bigger corrections needed. But also, how variable our measurement is determines how important this is. So again, this information measure is weighting how much we should care about this. And then that is what's added on to this final value to create our uh, estimated state position. Similarly, to estimate the final covariance, we're going to take that predicted covariance and then multiply it by this value. Now, what this is going to be is your identity matrices, which is equivalent to the number 1, minus the common information times C. And so, remember, the larger, let's just say this is 0. Say there's 0 information. If this is 0, we just have identity times this, which just gives you back this. That is, the variance doesn't change if there's no information in the measurement. But the more formative the measurement is, the smaller this value will be, and basically we'll be getting just a fraction of this predicted variance. And so, the more formative it is, the tighter our variance will be, which you would expect, because therefore you have a better estimation of the final state. And so all these things work together, and we're going to describe them in MATLAB and kind of look at the numbers and, and basically see how this whole thing plays out and what, what each of these different variables contribute. Okay?